a very warm welcome to everyone who is watching. For those of you who are new to us, Conscious Development is a human development organization for business and community impact because it understands that we as a planet of passionate individuals, ambitious businesses, and of course the generous Gaia are completely and deeply interconnected and interdependent. My name is Satyashiv Dumelo, and I lead Conscious Development's work in the space of DEI and B and well-being. Today, I have the great honor of introducing a thought leader who has been a medium of evolution and change in countless human systems. I take great pleasure in introducing my teacher, David Cooperider. David has served as an advisor to prominent leaders in business and society, including projects with five presidents mm -hmm. and Nobel laureates, such as William Jefferson Clinton, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Kofi Annan, and Jimmy Carter. David advises a wide variety of corporations, including Apple, Johnson & Johnson, Keurig Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, Verizon, Hunter Douglas, Walmart, McKinsey, and as well as the Navy, Red Cross, United Way of America, USAID, United Nations, the Global Impact, and hundreds of international private voluntary organizations. David is also a founding board member of the International Association of Positive Psychology, the Dow Institute, and a fellow of the World Business Academy. Earlier in the growth of the UN Global Compact, David was called upon by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan to facilitate, using a pressure of inquiry, the largest summit in history between business CEOs and leaders of government and civil society. It was one of the high point moments in David's career with reverberations that continue to grow. David is the founder of the Global Forum of Business as an agent of world benefit. It was launched in partnership with the UN Global Compact and with the Academy of Management. Its mission, a world where business can excel, all people can flourish and nature can thrive. David's most recent research study focuses on the history of business and human well-being. Thank you for being here today, David. Great to be with you, Shiv. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> so David, amongst the countless things that we can discuss today, I would like to address something specific with you. One of the foundational requirements that we consider um, that facilitates change is our willingness and our readiness towards that change. Through our work at Conscious Development, we often notice that there is an automation, an almost mechanical aspect to human thinking and behavior, especially when it comes to balancing planet and people with profit. We value sameness and from a sustainability and change perspective, we know that as human beings and systems, we must change our mindsets and processes in order to survive and of course thrive. Mm -hmm. Gone are the days where any part of the system, ecosystem or stakeholder group can be marginalized. Mm -hmm. Knowing this, I would really like to hear from you in your perspective, what will motivate businesses to change in the direction of a sustainable future. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's a there's a lot of different motivations, but I think um, fundamentally, I think all of us know deep in ourselves, deep in our bodies, deep in our consciousness that um, that we are all interconnected, and when one part of the system is hurting. Um, all parts begin to hurt. And so I think, you know, at a right. deep level, um, you know, it's, it's emerging that consciousness of connection. It's, and, um, and today I, I see that happening more rapidly than I'd ever seen before. Um, I think people like in the studies of human flourishing, um, and that, you know, that's a huge giant subject, the whole positive psychology of human flourishing. And it's a wonderful field that's emerged here. Um, there's kind of a formula of human flourishing that sums up, I think, two decades of research on, on, on human, human beings coming alive. And um, the acronym that Marty Seligman gave it, um, he's the father of the positive psychology movement, was PERMA. 
um, and that our lives are flourishing um, when there is an, a, a, you know, a, 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 a foundation of positive emotion in our lives. P stands for positive emotion, hope, inspiration, joy. Those positive emotions um, um, are part of a flourishing life. The second is engagement of our deepest human strengths, you know, our character strengths, our strengths of wisdom, our strengths of fairness, our strengths of justice, and so on. So E, engaging our signature strengths. Um, um, R is relationships, high quality relationships, um, life giving relationships, relationships where people can see the best in each other and elevate that. And then meaning, M is a life of meaning and purpose. And then A is achievement. Well, what I'm seeing in companies that are adopting sustainability is that all five of those PERMA mechanisms, those deeper mechanisms related to human flourishing come to life. Um, and it's been really intriguing to me to think through, um, you know, how, how do we get there in these companies? Um, one book um, called Flourishing Enterprise um, argues that it, it, it's, it starts deep within the individual in terms of our worldview, the leader, um, the sense of, of of, of consciousness of our connection and then that leads to um, building a culture of sustainability and finding that sustainability ignites imagination ignites you know takes out costs out of the business and so on and then ultimately become an agent of change out there so that sequence is important but what i'm seeing is that companies that decide not so much to look on the inside of the company but decide to become an agent of change in the world. Uh, uh, I call it business as an agent of world benefit. Um, and if they call the whole company to do that, um, all of a sudden, as they begin to contribute to building a better world out there, guess what happens to the in here of their company? It comes to life. And so there's a natural process here. Um, uh, Clark Industries, for example, a very um, unsustainable business in terms of toxicity and so on in the mosquito control business. And Lyle Clark just felt like, you know, we've got to do better. Our whole planet is calling for a transition to a bright green economy. And, and he didn't know how to do it. Um, he brought his executive team together and, he, and they were at a hotel that had a swimming pool. And he said, I know we need to make a deep dive into a, a new purpose. Um, and he invited his executives to jump in the pool. <laughs> and they did with their clothes on. And it, he said, I felt so vulnerable. I didn't know how we were going to become a sustainable company. But then they did an appreciative inquiry summit, brought 700 leaders um, at every shop floor all the way to the CEO, brought their customers, brought other companies that are leaders in sustainability, and they gave birth to their sustainable value strategies. And for example, two years later, they won the Green Chemistry Award for no toxicity the presidential green chemistry award for no toxicity in their mosquito approach. No, no, no chemicals whatsoever. Um, they've gone on. But what we notice is that the inside of the company comes to life when people are invited to live a life. And I, 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 it's almost like every single one of those PERMA mechanisms positive emotion of hope, inspiration, and joy, engagement, where we feel like it's part of our flow, um, the desire for relationships that are life-giving and the meaning that comes and accomplishment. So there's a natural trajectory. And if a company's having trouble on the inside, like it, in, in Detroit, there was a, um, a company in the auto industry that came to me and the CEO said, David, you've got to come in and, you know, um, look at and bring organization development. And we've got silos and people have lost confidence. We've made mistakes and the morale is low and the turnover is high. Um, people don't have a belief in this company anymore. And they, and he said, can you come in and help us do team building and get the communications going? And, and I said, no, don't focus on the inside of your company. 
go directly to what can your company do to build a better world and, and do it in a way that pre opens up new possibilities and products for your business. That's the fastest way to bring the company to life on the inside. I, what I love most about your answer, David, is that there's a, there's, a, there's a trust in the goodness and the fundamental character of every human being. And the moment there's an opportunity to act towards positive change, it does something to us. Right. It pulls us out of the redundancy of everyday living and gives a little bit of purpose. And I, I, I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and there's data and research there. You can look this one up. Um, it's a book of 700 studies and it's called Why Good Things Happen to Good People. And it's all about, right. you know, it's tracking from an early age, like let's say eight years old in those families and households and um, schools that help the children take on an altruism stance towards the world. Um, and where that happens early on, you can predict, um, 50 years later, you can predict depression is reduced, well-being and good fortune are increased, um, mortality is delayed. Um, so anyway, there's, it's, a, it's a concept I call mirror flourishing by helping to right. build a better world out there. Guess who right. also flourishes at the same time? Yeah. Right. And that also helps us bypass the resistances a little bit. Because a lot of time we spend so much effort and energy just trying to um, dodge the resistances in a system. But this is yeah. great when we get to put it outwards. Yeah, that's, that's true. And the other thing is, is in our organizations, um, this is that people don't resist change. That's the, our whole field of organization development grew up with that formula mm -hmm. that people basically are afraid and resist change. But people don't resist change, they resist being changed. So like mm -hmm. in this case of Clark Industries, he brought together the truck drivers and the loaders and the manufacturing uh, together with the board and the CEO and the chief financial officer together with customers in the room and so on. Um, and so there are methods um, today that are built on the principle of wholeness. That, you know, it's not top down approach to change. It's mm -hmm. not bottom up. It's whole. It includes top down. It includes bottom up, and um, right. and it's exciting how wholeness brings out the best in human listening and behavior and concern for the other. Right, right, wonderful. So, David, I have, um, I, I, I love the answer, and I and I completely agree with it. And I have another follow up question because I know that we live in a time of grand binaries. Some of us aspire to create positive change in the lives of others, while some of us aspire to act towards personal profit. Some of us believe in a sustainable future, while some of us believe that sustainability can be the purpose for others, but doesn't have to be mine. What, brings, what this often brings up at Conscious Development is the recognition that everyone has their stories. And those stories serve as different starting points and different goals. Mm -hmm. As the architect of appreciative inquiry, I'm really keen to hear from you. How do we get people on the same page about the need for a sustainable future? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a it's an incredibly important question, um, and I there's we are in a really really radically important moment and maybe the most important decade in humankind's history. Um, but I think um, oh, one way I'm going to answer it is I think, um, you know, like the IPPC report just called Code Red for Humanity, that we are nowhere on track in terms of, you know, um, the, keeping up with what it's going to take to realize our Paris and our climate change goals and so on. You know, we've got a huge right. task as a human family if we believe the science and, um, and you know, we have to cut our carbon impact in half 
by with, within this decade in order to have a chance to get to a net zero, a completely um, decoupled and de, you know a carbon zero economy by 2050 to have a chance to keep the weathers and the climate system um, um, at a healthier level. So, um, so I've been puzzling over this. I did meet with Nikhil Seth. Um, he was the he's the um, Secretary General, um, Assistant Secretary General of the UN, and head of um, UNITAR, the United Nations Training and Research. He's the one that organized the one of the Earth summits um, called Rio Plus Twenty that led to the mm-hmm. Paris Agreement. And he just he he is so clear that we cannot allow these next two decades to fail. We will lose our our, our sense of, of trust in one another and our capacity together. So that's one side of the occasion. And, but I think um, what's emerging is really important, um, and it's happening so rapidly in our studies. We've done 6,000 interviews into business uh, as an agent of world benefit, business as a force for peace and high conflict zones, business as a force for helping this mighty transition from a fossil fuel era. Um, you know, these are once in a civilization type opportunities that we're facing. Right. And for the first time, I'm feeling um, I'm feeling like the world is coming together in a way it's never come together. Muhammad Yunus made some comments about what a miracle it was to even get to a point of 170 or 90 countries agreeing around the Paris goals. What a miracle of uh, to you know get to a point where 190 countries have adopted the Sustainable Development Goals as part of our common right. ten. And so there's an economist who's been studying this. Her name's Mariana Mazacuto. Um, and she studies what she calls mission moments. Um, like every country has uh, had some kind of mission moment, you know, the green revolution, right. to feed people or whatever. And she studied over 100 mission moments in about 120 countries. And, um, and her her biggest example is Kennedy's moonshot um, moment, the kind of an archetype example, calling a country together, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And um, and I am feeling like we may be entering a moment that's the world's first shared moonshot moment. So let's call it an earth shot. And it's this once in a civilization type opportunity over the next 10 years to, and it's no longer utopian to talk about it, to create a world right. of hundred percent renewable energy within a couple of decades, right. um, to create a world where extreme poverty has been eradicated from the planet, to create a world where every child has access to school and education, um, to create a world where economies are circular, that they regenerate as we go Um, to create a world filled with positive institutions that are helping to build better communities. So that's what our book is about, uh, this moonshot moment. It's a very special moment. And it's, I think, the largest coming together of humankind um, that's ever happened. We have examples where we've come together, like the global eradication of smallpox, first time in human history that we've eradicated Mm -hmm. it. Um, a deadly disease together, collaboratively, uh, the Montreal Protocol to end the ozone depletion, um, the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe, and so on. But what the this moonshot mission that we have today to move from a totally unsustainable to reinvent the entire material basis of our economy in a couple decades, um, and I feel, I feel like the that. People everywhere are responding, especially the business world and especially our young people at USC, um, one of the large universities in the U.S. They just did a study, a survey with all their students and 75 percent of them want to go into work that's working on climate action, on equity and inclusion and diversity um, and creating a world where um, where there's opportunity for all. 75% 75% of our young people want to work in climate action. Yeah. Right, right. That's, that's it. That inspires me, and I feel hopeful. And I recognize 
um, and uh, celebrate the value of coming together. And I, I feel like it, it, there is a sense of fatigue every now and then, Mm -hmm. but keeping our eye on the fact that there is shared purpose and that across the planet, um, there is this union of, of meaning and, and action and intention and action. And, um, I, I celebrate that. And of course, through that, I celebrate you with all the good work that you're doing. And that leads me to my, my next question. We are very, very excited about your new book coming out this November, mm-hmm. the business of building a better world, the leadership revolution that is changing everything. As we anticipate its publish, what can you tell us about your book and its value in today's workplace? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it articulates um, just everything that's happening and moves us to understand this mission moment. So, you know, we've talked mm-hmm. about companies with high purpose and sustainable companies. Now we're talking about a whole economy that's taking on a mission. So we start there um, with this mission economy proposition and that that is taking everything else in the sustainability agenda you know, by creating not just high purpose company, but a purpose economy um, mm-hmm. that is creating a shift in companies all over the world. Um, so companies like Unilever adopted all 17 global goals, not um, not as a sideline to the business, but as the core to creating their strategic imperatives in every single domain. And today, you know, they have gender equality, for example, on the board. So th- thousands of organizations are emerging like that. Um, so we're, we're, that's one thing that we've articulated in the book and have hundreds of examples of companies. Like I, like I just spoke with Jesper Broden, the head of IKEA the other day. Um, right. And IKEA now is a perfect example of a company that's um, set its goals to become um, a net zero, you know, a, a, a sustainable company. Um, but now they're talking about net positive and how do they take part in regeneration? You know, we've got oceans and waterways that need regeneration. We need, and so that's the next le- next level. Um, it's, a, it's, it's about going net positive. And, and right. you know, there's wonderful examples in the world. And here's a small one, but it's 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 an interesting one in um, Netherlands. It's a company called OAT Shoes That Bloom. They wanted to be a sustainable company that appeals to young people. So they go to their designers and say, "Can you design us a gym shoe that young people are going to love? We need no advertising. It's all going to spread by word of mouth and excitement. Can you design us a gym shoe that?" Um, is made with completely biodegradable materials in renewable energy facilities. And by the way, instead of just less landfill at the end, um, can you design right. such a shoe that regenerates the planet? And they did. Right. And it's called Shoes That Bloom. And the young people love them. When you're done with your shoes, you go into your flower garden and plant them, and they become a right. flower. So this, it's, a, it's a seed image of... Um, of what happens when we turn to this kind of sustainability plus to create Mm -hmm. a world of full spectrum flourishing. And that's our North Star. Um, We call it full spectrum flourishing, a world where economies can excel, all people can thrive, and nature can flourish, not just now, but across the generations. And I feel like we have a North Star and it's unleashing incredible innovation and creativity. So the book gets into all of that and then it gets into the question of how. Um, and of course, we um, talk about our appreciative inquiry methodologies and the power of the human goodness that comes out when you break down all the silos and all the barriers. and. You you, you, you you say, you know, um, organizations are centers of human relationships and they come alive where there's an appreciative eye, where people take the time to search for the true, the good, the better, the possible in each human being and use our collective strengths and create this alignment of strengths that makes our weaknesses irrelevant. And um, so we get into the how of building businesses um, as a business, as, as a force for, you know, um, 
as a as a force for this massive transition moment that the, that we're that we're in as a planet. Right. I'm very excited. I'm very excited to read it. Um, and thank you. I, not only do I feel inspired, but I also I, I, I'm experiencing excitement for the future. Oh. And that is, uh, that is a um, wonderful feeling to have. Thanks, yeah. David. Thank you, you for being here with us today. <laughs> thank and you. For thank you for all the meaningful work. Oh, okay. My pleasure, David. And I look forward to many, many more conversations. Be well, and thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David.